Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer, Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Welcome, Karen, to the Digital Workspace with podcast. Do you want to introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Gondoli. I am the CEO of a software company called LeoStream. Great. And, and do you want to tell us what the Digital Workspace means to you and your company? So for us, what it all is about is enabling users to work from anywhere. That's the great thing when your workplace is digital. As you move around, you always can access it if you have the right tools. You know, I don't need to have my physical laptop anymore. I can log in from anywhere and get access. So really, to me, that's the key is the digital workspace really enables the, the modern workplace, which is work from anywhere, access to what you need whenever you need it. Great. And you, before we started recording, you mentioned that security was very important to what you guys do. I mean, how does that come into what your product does different to, to the others? Well, what we do, so what LeoStream provides is the, the technical name of the product is the remote desktop access platform. It's a bit of a mouthful. And, you know, in the olden days, people called it VDI, which is kind of a dying term. And now you talk about desktops as a service. But for us, it's really, it's about remote access. And when you are giving people access to data and applications that they are not physically near, what you need to be doing is making sure that you're securing that access. So the right people are logging in and only getting the right access. So we allow people to architect zero trust concepts into that remote access. I mean, we're not a full, we're not like a, a Zscaler, we're not a full zero trust appliance, but it's about giving people the tools so that they can ensure the security by implementing these zero trust concepts. Because really zero trust, it's not a, there's no applications, it's a bunch of concepts. And that's what we want people to do using our platform. Great. So how would somebody implement that? I mean, what would be the starting point to bring your product in and why would they do it primarily? I mean, common use cases. Well, there's a few really. So we do a lot currently with organizations, enterprises that have power users who are doing complex data analysis or visualization, basically high performance compute, high performance graphics. So for these like post-production media and entertainment engineers who want to be able to work from anywhere, but the media industry wants to keep the data, which is very proprietary. Nobody wants their their show leaked before it's ready to go <laughs> to the theater. Yeah. So to make it secure, they keep that data locked away either in their data center or maybe up in the private network in the cloud and give these editors access to that data to do their jobs from anywhere. It means that they can hire from anywhere, provide people with kind of that work-life balance that we're all talking about now. So that's just one particular use case. And what we give people we sell downloadable software, so it's not a service. We give you our platform and then they can install it wherever makes sense for them. So flexibility to pick the cloud they want to host their infrastructure and okay. maybe yeah. have some things on-prem. That way, again, it's about security. The organization not doesn't just own the data plane, they own the control plane too. The piece that's implementing their multi-factor authentication rules and enforcing all of their access control rules, the organizations get to hold and own that as well and so again security they own everything so i mean so so for an end user experience and i'm trying to remember what we used to use back in the days that i was involved in this stuff so we would have like a remote desktop application you deploy on your ipad that would connect you in through zscaler as you mentioned you would have your own app that would be similar to that but then you've provided a mechanism for the administrators to manage that path in with the right kind of security the entitlements of, of software uh, and that sort of thing. Is that is that the right understanding? Yeah, pretty close. So our platform has, there's two bits. One is what we call the connection broker. So it's where IT is going to define the access control rules. It's where they're going to indicate who has access to what, for how long, and what happens if that user goes idle. And then there's the gateway part of our platform, which is essentially the VPN replacement. So now instead of mm. opening up your network, the connection broker intelligently tells the LeoStream gateway, okay, this user's logged in. 
at this particular time from this particular location, here's what they're allowed to connect to, and then the gateway intelligently opens up that network traffic for the user instead of opening up the network at large. Uh, yeah, I understood. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's very similar to what I would have worked with as well. So what is the value proposition to the business nowadays? I mean, is it about throughput? Do, do they Are they trying to get more of their users empowered to work remotely? Or do you think it's still about just any device, anywhere, anytime? It's a few things. One, there's definitely some of that any device, anywhere, anytime aspect. But then it's also, again, about security. One of the keys is, you know, people are very protective of their data right now. And you want to ensure that you can allow people to work from anywhere while also keeping your corporate resources secure. So that's mm, a mm. big motivator for all of this. That helps the company mitigate risks associated with losing data. And then also you can, using a platform such as ours or any other kind of remote access platform, you can mitigate the risk of lost production time because now if a user can't come in for the day, employee can't come in, they can work from home and that allows them to not lose that time because time is money, obviously. And that's another big thing is saving money. We see a lot of people migrating workloads up to the cloud, but the cloud costs can run away from people if they're not managing, you know, when is my compute running? Do I have capacity I don't need? And so that's some of the other things that a tool like ours provides is automation for IT. So it will spin mm. up instances in the, in the cloud as demand grows and then tear them back down, terminate them when the demand goes away. Because the last thing IT wants to do is be constantly controlling and monitoring these things. For us, another big benefit is just simplifying IT. It's about making it so that these the poor IT staffs that are now kind of getting understaffed and overworked have tools that allow them to easily manage multiple platforms from a single pane of glass, have ways to easily automate tasks so that they can concentrate on more important things. Oh, yeah. And, and I was actually going to ask you the question on scaling. I'm glad you brought it up because I forgot about it. Because that, that's one of the things that, that's always been the trickiest is, is dealing with those seasonal increases, not only from a, you know, the business has got seasonal, like, you know, accounting periods that rolling over, that sort of thing. But also some businesses will have, and I worked with UEFA many years ago, where they'd hire a whole lot of people to work on the tournament. So they have to spin up the environments for people who work on the tournament. The tournament lasts, you know, a couple of months, and then they have to shut it all down again. And in the old days, they would buy laptops and then they'd set the laptops in the cupboard and then they would have to read, you know, as it, as the period came close, they'd have to read all the laptops. And then you obviously have, you know, capacity problems there because only so many laptops you can rebuild at a time and, right. and all that sort of stuff. So this kind of stuff makes a lot of sense there. And I was curious about with, you know, obviously Citrix has been a player in this space for a long time. And the move to clouds, you know, Amazon has, AWS has their offering for, for desktop as a service. Uh, Microsoft has various offerings, you know, Azure Desktop, uh, Microsoft Desktop, and there's some, I can, which one that one is. Are, are you seeing any sort of preference to either of those offerings or are customers still building their own things internally and exposing it outward using some sort of an on-premise hybrid and, and cloud, I guess, would be my three categories. Well, what do you guys see? A little of everything, really, and because different solutions are going to be better for different user groups. And so mm. there are use cases where Windows 365, particularly if an organization is a Microsoft shop, Windows 365 will be great for a fleet of task workers. There are cases where Amazon Workspaces or Workspaces Core is going to be great, particularly now that you can bring your Office 365 license in there. So that, that's you know, maybe for your knowledge users, you want to use something like that. If you have, if you've purchased a lot of hardware that you want to continue using, that's all on-prem, but you want a people to be able to access that when they're not on-prem as well. So the key is that look for the solution that's best for your end user and then look for a tool that simplifies the access to that because you will as a larger enterprise you know if you're a 25 user enterprise maybe not so much it's not really an enterprise but if you're a large enterprise you want to use the correct tool for the different types of users and then have one single pane of glass portal where people can go to get everything and IT can go to manage it because that way you're providing the best experience for the user by simplifying access and also giving them the right resource in a way that is going to hopefully optimize costs for the organization. You know, use smaller instance sizes for users who are just maybe doing some word processing while you use your on-prem GPU enabled workstations for the users who are doing the complex large data set applications. Well, I guess that's a good question. I mean, do, are you seeing, because I remember we used to have the, the sort of concept of, of a, not, not really a knowledge worker, but a very thin layer worker, someone that 
you know, really was spending most of their time in very basic, well, Outlook for sure, maybe a bit of Word, a little bit of PowerPoint. And then Excel was kind of that one that was in the middle because sometimes Excel would just be a very basic spreadsheet, you know, 20, 30 rows, a couple of worksheets. And you, then you have the sort of person dealing with 100,000 rows or more. Do you see it that granularly in the sense of a very thin layer that you're offering and then the power user that you mentioned becoming more and more delivered this way or are they still putting them in physical desktops that you're connecting to? I think the power users are moving away from the physical desktops and and some of that is, well, at least recently, some of that is, you know, whether it was hard to get a GPU. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was easier to rent, quote unquote, GPUs in the cloud. If you wanted to do anything related to AI yeah. or something, you were just going up and moving into the cloud instead of buying physical hardware. And to your point earlier, it's expensive to buy hardware, it's going to age out. And if you can rent that in a cloud, then that's a much easier solution and more cost effective from the organization. Yeah, I mean, I remember we were doing migrations at a, at a time and, and, and the business case that was that was signed off was based on hardware reclamation being the save. But to your point around data retention, that was always going to be the higher value return by moving people to a, and not to get rid of physicals, but, but reducing the amount of data on the physicals and having it all held in a data center that was secured and especially you know, most cloud environments are very secure. And I'm just wondering, do you guys, when you sell your product, do you get into a value conversation? Do you do you say, well, this is how, this is why you need to do this. Here is your benefits of having a remote desktop access control system. You know, it's funny, we tend to be brought in a little later, I think, in the sales cycle, just as the way things work out, because we're just a small slice of the stack. So somebody has already started thinking about moving to the cloud. And so they already have kind of wrapped their head around some of the benefits of why they would want to do that. And now what they're trying to figure out is how do they manage that in a way that optimizes the environment and simplifies IT. So we are trying to move ourselves up in the conversation, but right now that tends to be where our focus is when we talk to people. Yeah, no, the reason why I ask that question is I spend a lot of time personally with customers that have bought a solution. They've spent, you know, six, seven figures on it. And they're saying, well, I bought this thing, but I don't see the value. Like, why have I got this thing? And you've got to almost, there was a business case that was done, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months ago. And you got to go back to the original business case and say, well, this is why you justified it. Okay, now we're fast forwarding and you got away with it then, but now you got to justify it again and find those levers. Is it a risk mitigation? Is it a cost save? Uh, is it a productivity gain? That's pretty much the main three usually. And then tie that to those use cases. So if you had a mobile workforce, you're, you know, you're saying, well, your mobile workforce is, is much more productive because they're on, the, they're on the road and able to access using this technology and do the work without having to you know, find a hotel or a restaurant with Wi-Fi, whatever, you know, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked the question, because it, it, it becomes very common to sort of keep not justifying, but reinforcing why this is a valuable part of the solution. Right, right. And it's funny because you, you said something that made me remember a, a particular customer that I've worked with who came to LeoStream after, you know, they had done the business justification and invested in a system and built it all up and then realized, oh, this one system's not working for me. And then they came to LeoStream and said, you know, please, please deliver me a Hail Mary and, and make this work. And and we did. And so it's it's those things. That's why I'm saying if we can get higher up in the conversation, the, the same, these business use cases and these business initiatives that you're trying to solve, you can do them with a digital workplace and a remote access solution. You just yeah. have to be cognizant of all the different pieces that are coming into play and choose the best of breed to make sure that you can get to where you want to go. Yeah. I'm curious, where did the name come from? <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, one of our found founders is from South Africa. The other is from the UK. And in the UK, there was a tea shop that had the first computing device, the name of which was Leo. And this was hmm. essentially a Com computer quote unquote that made change for the for the tea shop so that is where the leo part of the name came from the stream part is kind of lost in urban legend to me i've heard many stories from the tea shop was on a stream to it just sounded nice together but the leo part is definitely the computer well yeah i mean i think i think stream makes sense from a you, you know you're streaming data backwards and forwards so yeah right well, the curious thing is, you know, our company was is around since 2002, so well before the day of remote access or VDI or anything. It was we started in the land of virtual servers and doing physical to virtual machine conversions. So that's why I start to think that maybe it was just stream sounded nice. Yeah, no, that, I mean, I think it's a great name. I was I was hoping the South African connection would come in with some sort of lion story or something, oh. and you know, Epiphany in the bush would, would have been a great. <laughs> 
great story. So, I mean, we're going to the end of the year now. I mean, what are your feelings around market for 2024? Any any big plans for the company or your customers? Yeah, we have a whole bunch of interesting stuff going on. We're kind of looking at, you know, I was I was speaking with someone who said, well, the big question is, well, how are you always wrapping AI into your platform? And and we always say, well, it's, you know, you really don't want AI controlling your access control rules. You want to lock those down yourself. But it is true that AI can come into play in the scheme of a remote access environment because you want to, again, you don't want people running these AI tools on their own laptops. Maybe you want to lock them away so that they can't cut and paste to their own corporate device and things like that. So we're starting to look at how do we enable those kind of workflows more? What additional tools will we need to disable cut and paste through our HTML5 viewer, for example, and, and things like that? We're also doing a lot of work to make it easier to schedule access. You know, if you think of some use cases of labs of computers that are locked away, obviously in the corporate building, but you want to give remote access to them. So you want to do that based on, you know, what students are accessing that lab at a particular type of day or what project is going on. So we're looking at some calendar integration so you can schedule access based on time. So that'll be kind of cool. So yeah, there's some there's some good things going down. I think, you know, the what we have been calling remote access and work from home is now just kind of the modern way of working. It's going to remain hybrid for as long as I can see. And so we just want to make sure that we can support that for organizations in the way that works best well. for them. I mean, I, I could think of a few AI implementations for you guys. I mean, I, you know, while you were talking about time-based access, I was thinking about, you know, some of the security things like, you know, if you've got users logging in outside of their normal working hours, you'd want to be flagging that, mm -hmm. potentially engage them and asking them why are you logging on now? You know, there was, when I was in, not, I wasn't involved in it, but prior to my joining UBS, we, we caught the whale who was doing illegal trades. And they figured that out because he was logging in outside of his normal working hours. So, you know, because you've got basically the channel from the person's location into the business, you can profile the users quite well, or, you know, not necessarily by person, but, anom you know, as aggregations of things and see some stuff. And then from a health and wellness point of view, people that are spending too much time working. Right. That's a good yeah, point. You know, you know, especially if you go into Europe where, I mean, you can't send an email to a French company, I think, and a German company outside of working hours. Or expected to be responded to same as you you know could be locking down people's access so mm -hmm. they're not working outside of working hours so you know a learning mechanism not necessarily a, a chat gdp thing but just a basic machine learning thing i say basic but you know what i mean <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> learning learning behaviors and making recommendations and also going back to those seasonal things people always have an opinion of where the seasonal things are mm -hmm. but because you're managing the connection you've got the data that tells you well actually during seven to nine is actually not a busy time it's nine to ten is the worst time because that's everyone dropped the kids off at school they're logging in to get on that first meeting that's when you need to have capacity so you can pre-warm up capacity and, and all that kind of stuff so those are just things i was thinking about potentially just normal applications of machine learning or even the fun yeah stuff. i like that. that those are some good ones i'm glad we're recording this yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you know my background has been end user experience. So, you know, constantly thinking about how do you make the end user have the least amount of friction possible to do their jobs. So a person that's using Excel and they're doing more than 65,000 lines worth of Excel rows, they need to be on the 64-bit version versus the 32-bit version. But then also what kind of machine are they on? Are they backed off to a physical device or to, you know, and it comes down to what they're doing as a, as a job yeah. function. That's where that question was coming from. And then, I, you know, these other things that you know, people on calls all day long, do they really need to be on a remote session into a call or could they be on an app on a phone? Right. You know, that sort of thing. Do, do you find that you're going down or you're considering a headless route to remote access? So not having to go through a session, but actually go through sort of a back, not a back channel, but but a sort of hidden by and something else as your connection into through your VPN stream. Yeah, we haven't even, we haven't really considered that. So that's another interesting idea out of, out of this call. <laughs> I was just thinking about it in the sense of, you know, very much an API economy, I think, is is coming up more and more now where, you know, there's only so many ways you can build a front end. And I, might, I must say we've perfected it, but you see the same thing starting to repeat. Once someone gets a good idea and people start liking it, then you see like a whole bunch of them follow the same idea. So in order to get your product to market faster, you, instead of worrying about the UI, you build the API layer or the services or the protocols that people can use. And you just basically providing the mechanism to deliver on the service and someone else worries about the UI. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get there. We've we started building a RESTful API for the entire product, so you can configure and do everything from from this yeah. RESTful API. But we're at the very early stages of that. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a big mindset shift to do that stuff because for you know obviously when you're building the app yourself, you you take not only shortcuts, but you take certain decisions that get you there to get the product out. But when you start thinking about APIs and, and thinking about all the people all the people that are going to use them and how they're going to use them, you've got to really think about you know not necessarily everything but a lot of stuff you hadn't thought about before so it can be can be tricky yeah we <laughs> okay. okay i was gonna say just we found that de developing features at the same time trying to build the api to support it and the features that were already in there is so <laughs> tricky as well <laughs> yeah building the plane while you're flying it yes <laughs> yeah yeah no, good good I, I don't have any other really thoughts right now i mean is there anything else you want to share or do you want to people can get in contact with you yeah sure you know if you want to learn more about leostream we've got a website leostream.com pretty straightforward yeah. and yeah no we look forward to helping really any industry any workflow any cloud oh. we got you covered just one other thought i mean do you guys do a trial with anybody i mean did, could, could they come and see how your product works somehow is there a demo environment Definitely. or yeah, yeah. If you go through our, if you look at our website, you can uh, schedule a demo. You can request a free trial. I suggest the demo first because it, our our product is, you know, it's it's enterprise software. It's pretty robust. I don't want to use the word complex. It's pretty robust. There's a lot of features and functionality. So really, if you can see it in action with somebody, one of our sales engineers who are really really smart, you can watch them step you through it, and then you'll. You, you, you can hear people on the phone go, oh, I get it. But if you hand it to them, they might be a little less likely to be like, oh, I get it. So I suggest ask for a demo. We're happy to do one. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you know, there's a, there's a product that I work with a lot and it's, it's, exactly, it's a technical product. So you have to you have to know a little bit more about what you're looking at. Just just understand the, the benefits sometimes of what you're getting. But I've enjoyed talking to you and I think the product, you know, looks really good from what I've seen on the website and what we've talked about. I think it's in a good space. And I look forward to seeing how you guys do and perform in the market. So please do keep in touch. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Ryan. Great stuff. Thanks, Karen. All right. Take care. Oh, did you want to give your LinkedIn profile as well? Or, or they can find your LinkedIn, I guess. It's, everything's under Leo Stream. Yeah. There's not okay. a lot of Leo Streams around there. So you'll yeah. get to us. Great stuff. Cool. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.